Thank you for joining me. I'm Julie Ballou, and this is Rape the Podcast. I screwed up when I started to work on making this podcast. One of my best friends had told me bits and pieces about a very traumatic rape experience that happened to her. We're talking scars from cigarette burns all over her body. And even though it happened over a decade ago, she originally responded to a request for an interview enthusiastically and said she hadn't really talked about it. So she thought airing the story would be cathartic for her. And I encouraged her. A week or two later, when I tried to set up the interview, she told me she couldn't do it. She was having nightmares and all the rape trauma syndrome effects were too much for her. I felt horrible. I don't know why I didn't think that could happen and what I said that may have made her feel that way. She is one of the strongest women I know. Sadly, our planned lunches evaporated and while we're still friends, I'm afraid to approach her with anything for fear my podcast subject might come up. I know she's gonna get there, but she's just not ready yet. I don't know what exactly she's afraid of, but I could hear the fear in her voice. Besides fear, the biggest hurdle I'm having is shame. I'm ashamed of my rapes. I can't talk about my rapes yet. And I don't think it's fear holding me back. It's shame. Keeping our rapes a secret has a damaging side effect. That secret is what allows shame to fester inside. I'm embarrassed to discuss and even to think about it. Now, I've told a few really good friends... And their responses were appropriately empathetic. But to go public like I am now? Well, strangers may judge me and do it perhaps even on social media where everyone can see. Also, I've done such a great job of burying these memories. I'm still discovering them. I don't remember all the details. Once those memories vomit up, if you're only relying on yourself, more than likely, you're going to do whatever it takes to numb the pain of thoughts like what you could have done differently how you could have avoided it. You might start to punish yourself, even if someone tells you it wasn't your fault. If you go public, there will be people who will blame you in some way. At least you're pretty sure that'll happen because that's what happens to everybody else. If you're unsure of the details, it's kind of hard to tell people about what happened. Your brain starts to disassociate to get through everyday life. You might even convince yourself that it wasn't rape at all. You'll start minimizing what happened. Rape is an intimidating word. It's common to internalize the shame and embarrassment and even for survivors to blame themselves in anticipation of what skeptics will say. This shame impedes recovery. How do we face shame? Shame is an unknown epidemic, the secret behind many forms of broken behavior. Human behavior researcher Brene Brown, whose first TED Talk, explores what can happen when people confront their shame head on. The thing to understand about shame is it's not guilt. Shame is a focus on self. Guilt is a focus on behavior. Shame is I am bad. Guilt is I did something bad. How many of you, if you did something that was hurtful to me, would be willing to say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake? How many of you would be willing to say that? Guilt. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Shame. I'm sorry, I am a mistake. There is a huge difference between shame and guilt. And here's what you need to know. Shame is highly, highly correlated with addiction, depression, violence, aggression, bullying, suicide, eating disorders. And here's what you even need to know more. Guilt, inversely correlated with those things. The ability to hold something we've done or failed to do up against who we want to be is incredibly adaptive. It's uncomfortable, but it's adaptive. First of all, remember that guilt and shame are not the same thing. Guilt is when you did something wrong and you can feel remorse about it. Shame is the painful feeling of having done or experienced something dishonorable, improper, foolish, etc. Shame is that you will be judged by others. It's uncomfortable to hear about rape. Telling your story feels more like an admission of wrongdoing. And when you feel shame, it's helpful to know that what you're feeling isn't guilt. Guilt is what the rapist should feel. On November 6, 2018, Springfield Police Department responded to CNN reporter Ashley Franz in a statement. 
Like many other agencies across the country, the Springfield Police Department continues to evolve and grow alongside the community we serve. The shift in how society approaches sexual assault and domestic violence has been significant and resulted in changes to how policing agencies serve these victims. In some places, law enforcement has been slow to adjust, but SPD has been and will continue to be proactive in implementing new and improved practices in responding to and investigating such crimes. Here are some examples of what SPD has done to ensure that we most effectively and empathetically serve the citizens of Springfield. SPD researched to see if there was a backlog of sexual assault kits within our agency. Once we determined there had been a number of stored rape kits that had not been tested, we began the process of finding ways to test the backlog kits. Missouri Highway Patrol Crime Lab agreed to accept all untested kits from SPD that were less than one year old. They piloted a program with the Missouri Highway Patrol Crime Lab to systematically process the remaining untested kits. Applied for and accepted as a member of the SAK partnership with the FBI, Department of Justice, to fund the testing of backlog kits. 30 approved for testing in August 2017, but acceptance delayed until April 2018. No word on additional testing availability. I've got some news about that that we'll talk about later. In 2014, SPD became one of the first agencies in Missouri to begin submitting all rape kits to the crime lab for testing. In 2014, Chief Williams attended IACP's Violence Against Women Executive Training Program and Captain Tad Peters attended the VAW Supervisor Training. A thorough review of all related SPD policy and practices was conducted and is ongoing. In 2013, we created and implemented a domestic violence lethality assessment to assist victims in identifying indicators that may predict future domestic or sexual assault. We continue to provide trauma-informed sexual assault training to allow investigators to have a better understanding of victims' perspectives and behaviors. We worked with the Missouri Attorney General's Office to survey all state agencies, law enforcement, and medical to determine how many untested rape kits existed in Missouri. Then they sought the state legislators' help in allocating budget money to fund the testing of the backlog kits throughout the state. They supported the AG's grant application for funding to create a statewide tracking program for rape kits and to provide money to test all the backlog kits in Missouri. They continue to work with a variety of organizations to create a statewide tracking and testing program for rape kits, which includes SPD's practice of submitting all kits for testing. In 2018, SPD worked in conjunction with area service agencies to open one of only 25 family justice centers in the country. The goal of the center is to make the criminal justice system easier to navigate for victims of domestic and sexual violence. As law enforcement professionals, we are constantly looking for ways to improve. Over the past several years, we have taken an active role to make changes to alleviate the issue of sexual violence within our community and to better serve victims. And we will continue to do so in the years to come. Now, here's where it gets nasty. It is disappointing to see that you continue to focus your efforts on the past without including any information on the present nor any mention of what the future might hold. Whoa. There definitely seems to be some tension between the reporters of the CNN article and the Springfield Police Department. SPD believes that they may have missed some information and CNN believes the SPD may have missed an investigation. A few weeks ago, we told you about a CNN news story on how the Springfield Police Department mishandled rape kits. After the report, a local group called Me Too Springfield asked to speak with Police Chief Paul Williams about it. Tonight, Taylor Frost reports on that meeting and how it could impact the community. Well, that was not just important, essential that I, I meet face to face. It was more than I ever expected this meeting would be. We felt really great about it. A meeting asking for answers. We need law enforcement to be one of our first like go-tos in those processes. And so um, we really wanted to establish a working relationship instead of just trying to throw blame. Leaders of Me Too Springfield put together a list asking in-depth questions about the Springfield Police Department's past current, and future practices when it comes to sexual assault cases. 
It's an opportunity for me to answer some questions, provide some accurate information about how things are done and why things are done. Starting with past practices, the group asked why rape kits were destroyed in prior years. In essence, that, that should have never happened and, and won't happen ever again. Chief Williams says he's reviewing cases where kits were destroyed. It just kind of led us to believe that maybe some of these victims whose kits have been destroyed would still be able to pursue uh, prosecution and potentially conviction without that evidence. So it was nice to hear that there was still a possibility, like that wasn't a deal breaker not having the evidence. Part of the meeting also focused on how sexual assault cases are currently handled by the department. Chief Paul Williams says this report is outdated. We've changed significantly in this area. The department works through the Missouri State Highway Patrol Crime Lab, which is their only lab. They test 10 backlogged rape kits from the last five years each month. And specifically, Chief Williams was very, very um, forthcoming in like how that goes and and very willing to teach us. Um, and I think that answered a lot of really big questions that came from other victims. Moving forward, the department and the group plan to partner together. In fact, I made an offer that uh, they, they readily accepted. I have a chief community advisory group. Um, we're talking through who's going to take up that role. Continuing a conversation with a common goal. Reporting in Springfield, I'm Taylor Frost. Some of the discussions in the Me Too Springfield Police meeting centered around a letter that stated, while Me Too Springfield sincerely appreciates the department's acknowledgement that these cases were mishandled and the steps taken since 2014 to prevent further negligence, we are troubled by many unanswered questions. Get ready for these questions and the Springfield Police Department's answers in just a minute. Me Too Springfield continues to say, Although we are heartbroken and frustrated, we recognize that we want the same thing from our law enforcement that SPD wants, to evolve and grow alongside the community we serve. And because of SPD's commitment to being proactive, victim-centered, and trauma-informed, Me Too Springfield is confident that this is an opportunity for cooperative dialogue and the spirit of progress for our community. The question and answers went like this. Chief Williams stated he was unaware of at least two rape kits that were destroyed in 2015 after the department made changes. Will SPD, and specifically Chief Williams, assure us this will not happen again? Will SPD assure citizens that rape kits will only be destroyed once the statute of limitations is up and only after they have been analyzed for DNA evidence? The response says, since 2014 and continuing forward, SPD will ensure that all kits are submitted, tested, and post-testing is kept in accordance with Missouri state statute. It's now policy that rape kits will not be destroyed, even after testing is completed and the statute of limitations has expired. Me Too Springfield asked, Being understaffed, which SPD stated was the primary cause for the mishandling, may slow down investigations, but that is an inappropriate excuse for violating best practices and voluntarily destroying evidence. Will SPD assure citizens that they are sufficiently staffed? Will they assure citizens that evidence will not be destroyed regardless? SPD answered, being understaffed is not an excuse for past mistakes. In our statement, we simply meant to acknowledge staffing issues as a fact that was included in the story. We always strive to maintain appropriate levels of staffing and making that a reality is an ongoing goal. The 2017 renewal of the level property tax will allow us to add police staffing specifically investigators related to domestic violence and sex-related crimes. Me Too Springfield asked, We strongly assert that the cases that were mishandled still deserve the care and diligence as current cases. How are those errors being rectified, if at all? SPD says policy and practices have been changed to ensure that all sexual assault kits are tested and are retained indefinitely post-testing. And as reflected in the attached video, please refer to rapethepodcast.com and I'll get that link up, Chief Williams encourages victims who have reported sexual assaults in the past to contact the department if they feel they have been treated inappropriately. Me Too Springfield then asked, when was it determined how many stored rape kits had gone untested? How many have still not been sent off? Chief Williams ordered a review in 2014 of all sexual assault kits, determining at that time that there was an excess of 300 that had not been tested. And since that time, through a variety of means, we've been able to reduce the number of backlogged kits to 237. A plan is in place to eliminate that backlog within the next two years. Me Too Springfield then says, if in 2014, Chief Williams attended the IACP's Violence Against Women Executive Training Program 
and Captain Tad Peters attended the VAW supervisor training, why is the thorough review of all related SPD's policies and practices still ongoing? What policies have changed or what will change as a result? SPD says we continuously review all our policies and practices. This is no expectation. We made significant changes in 2014 as noted above, but continue to evaluate our policies and sexual assault investigations. A couple of recent examples are changes we are making within the department. Victim notification letter, commonly referred to as the 10-day letter, is being revised to eliminate the time requirement and reworded to reflect a more victim-centered, trauma-informed approach. Use of the prosecution waiver has been discontinued in sexual assault investigations and its use is being reviewed in all other criminal investigations. Finally, Me Too Springfield asked, SPD stated that CNN failed to report all of the details on the current policies that they were provided. Will SPD provide them to us? All the Springfield Police Department's standard operating guidelines are available on our website, they say. The most pertinent to your question is SOG 402.8, follow-up criminal investigations. If you have any additional questions, don't hesitate to contact us. Further questions and answers are detailed at rapethepodcast.com. I didn't hear much more about what Springfield police were doing to stay accountable until Springfield City Council approved the creation of a sexual assault task force in January of 2019. Their goal was to review current guidelines, research and pursue best practices to most effectively address sexual assault in the community. I really liked it when I heard that Springfield Councilwoman told the Springfield News Leader that she didn't want us to be good. She wanted us, meaning Springfield, to be great. She wants this to be a cutting-edge community when it comes to sexual assault and the victims and how they are served here. I spoke with one of the volunteers appointed to the task force. In November of 2019, I met with Janice Thompson, formerly Gerke. Janice didn't hesitate at all to participate when I told her about the podcast. Janice has been in the community's eye before when her ex-husband blamed her for his troubles leading up to when he decided to assault his ex-girlfriend and shoot the guy she was with in the Bass Pro Shops parking lot in 2016. And new tonight, a domestic abuse survivor says she now has closure after a man was sentenced to 45 years in prison for a 2016 shooting here in Springfield. As Braden Berg shows us, the victims in that case aren't the only ones who say they've been abuse victims of his past. Braden. Emily Greg Marvin was the man sentenced to 45 years in prison for that shooting. It happened in the Bass Pro parking lot in 2016 when he approached his ex-girlfriend and another man and beat his ex-girlfriend and shot the man. Now, earlier today, I spoke with Janice Gerke, who is Marvin's ex-wife and another abuse survivor of his. I remember being shocked at first and knowing immediately that I was in a lot of danger when he was strangling me and I started to lose consciousness. I knew if I if I went out that I wasn't going to survive. Gerke says the incident happened in 2003. She finalized a divorce with Marvin in 2006 and 10 years later, Marvin beat his ex-girlfriend and shot the man she was with. I pulled it up and I remember seeing the mug shot and not really understanding what was going on and uh, made a couple of phone calls and then heard it was my oldest son who actually called me and said oh my god mom dad's shot someone it was shock and disbelief but then also anger because for so long we knew that there was a chance he would do something like this gerke who is now an advocate for domestic abuse survivors attended the trial there was a safety in when he was in shackles and then seeing him during the actual trial in regular suit clothes, um, it was, we shook pretty much the whole time. And she even gave a testimony. To show that this was not the first time and this was not a, an incident as he, Greg had tried to play it off where he just snapped. He hadn't just snapped. He's been like this for a very long time. 15 years after the initial incident, and Gerke finally had some closure. Weight is lifted, but then there's also a little bit of remorse because you think this could have been so different. There, this could have been such a different world for all of us and it shouldn't have been this way. 
Another thing Gerke mentioned in the interview with her was how impressed she was with Greene County and how far they have come when it comes to dealing with domestic abuse cases in just the last 15 years. Live in the newsroom, I'm Braden Berg. I'm speaking with Janice Thompson, and she is a community activist and advocate and was a member of the Sexual Assault Task Force. Mm -hmm. You must have some experience with sexual assault. Do you want to talk about that? What my real experience is in as in terms of advocating for is domestic violence. Now, my ex-husband was the Bass Pro Shooter. And I don't know if you remember that story a couple of years ago, 2016, a man was shot five times and a woman beaten almost to death in the Bass Pro parking lot. Mm. That was my ex-husband. Now, was there sexual assault during the course of our marriage? Yeah, absolutely. That is pretty common. We don't recognize it. It's only been recently that I recognize that having not having the freedom to say no was something that was irregular in the marriage and not consenting and not really having that freedom to say yes or no to any act that happened between us. I have most of my friends that that are survivors, the same stories come true. These are the same stories that come out all the time. And uh, so this is a pretty common thing. What do we still say when we see a victim who's been raped? She shouldn't have been out. What was she thinking going into that room by herself? Should have known not to drink. We tell victims how to not be raped. It is ridiculous that we still have that comes out of our mouths that we say to, hey, you know, make sure you're traveling in a group. And we're acting like rape is only happening with a stranger when we know that most of it is happening with somebody that they know. So do we tell a girl that knows somebody that's known them for years and goes out for him? Hey, you know what? You shouldn't go out with that person that you've known forever and have a couple of drinks because he might rape you. We don't say things like that. We don't say to, we're, we're missing an entire conversation when it comes to this stuff. We're talking about consent. We're talking about all these things now, but we still blame victims for the assaults that happen to them. So what do we tell young boys or women, Um, girls who might also be abusers, don't rape? As simple as that to some degree. Yeah. But you know what we really do? And there's some statistics out there. So in the case of my kids, it is not set in stone if you grow up in an abusive household that you're going to be an abuser. But according to statistics, my sons who grew up in a home with a very violent abuser were a thousand times more likely to be abusers. A thousand times more Um, likely. Yep. That is for the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. That was a fact from them. It's men who witness violence between parents are three times more likely to abuse their own wives and children than that of nonviolent parents. The sons of the most violent parents are a thousand times more likely to become batterers. How do I discuss that with my kids? How scary is that for a mother to have that your sons are that in that situation? How scary is it? You it's tell extremely, me. It's extremely scary. So what we do is we talk about it and we talk about ways to respect women. You don't call a woman a bitch a slut whore. Um, if, if I have a daughter, it's not okay to sit around and call men stupid, idiot, dicks, morons, all these other things. We don't call each other names. We respect one another. I don't have to like you, but I don't need to call you a name to put you down, to dehumanize you. We have to see people as humans. We have to know how to step in to situations. I remember uh, years ago, and I won't say which one of my sons was in a relationship and he was mad and he said she cheated on me and he called her a name. And I said, then I guess you should tell her thank you because you're not in that relationship with her anymore. And clearly this wasn't working out. And it was a moment that it was like, oh. And I said, this isn't a fault with you. This is something within herself. Whatever she's got that she needs to deal with, that's just going to be what she deals with. So it's that constant talking, that constant looking at a movie. And there's so many movies out there that I think, wow. What a horrible way that we're teaching people to look at each other. Jackson Katz is another person who will bring up a lot of those, K-A-T-Z. And he'll talk about the way that society really teaches us how to look at each other. Have you ever seen the movie Gone with the Wind? Oh, yes. I grew up loving that movie. You watch it now and it now I feels see. a little weird. It does. Rhett rapes her. Red abuser. Red takes her child from her and he tells her how awful she is for loving a man who actually respects her. So you look at that and you think, wow, look at the messages that are sent to us. The movie Porky's, American Pie, Revenge of the Nerds. He rapes her. But yet, oh, she falls in love and they're married because mm-hmm. that's what. And so we've taught our daughters, we've taught our sons so many of the wrong messages. And just talking to them, that's how it stops this. I look back at my ex-husband and his childhood. 
And I've talked to people that he went to high school with, his first wife, and I think to myself, had your mother and father at one point said to you, after the first victim, after the third victim came to you and told you that Greg was being abusive and inappropriate, instead of saying what a selfish bitch she was, what a cheating whore she was, maybe had you said you have a problem and you need to deal with it, maybe we wouldn't be here. Because the last thing in this world I would have ever wanted was for my sons to have a father in prison. Mm-hmm. The, the repercussions of his actions will touch them forever. Think about when they want to get married. The father of their future wife or the mother of their future wife is going to be like, where's your dad? He's in prison. What's he in prison for? Abuse. You don't think that they're going to look at my sons and wonder? That'll be it's a heavy fear. load for them to carry. It is. It's a heavy load, and it's an unfair load. And they are very good about speaking out against this. My boys will call me if they have a friend who they think is being victimized or who's had a situation happen. Believing victims, that's a big thing. Teaching them to listen and not judge. We're not, a lot of times, asking you for your opinion. We're just wanting you to hear our story. Mm-hmm. And so I think all of that is where we change this. Have you run into any situations where... A woman is making up the story. No, I have it personally. I'm not saying that it never happens. We have got to get people past that because it is the only crime I can think of that we say that. People falsely report car break-ins all the time. Do we ask about that? People, oh, I somebody ran me off the road. I work in personal injury. We see that. Somebody ran me off the road. Really? She called police? No. Just what happened. Yeah. And it might be. Yeah. But there are people that pull that. Mm-hmm. And But we don't look at them and go, sometimes people make that up. Are you sure you didn't pull in front of that person and slam on your brakes so they could hit you in the back? Are you sure you didn't deserve to get hit in the yeah. back? Yeah. Maybe you shouldn't have been going that direction. Mm-hmm. That's a bad road. Driving the wrong car. Yeah. Your car's hard to see. Mm-hmm. That's usually what I blame people on. I couldn't see your car because it's gray and it blends in with the street. <laughs> We don't say that to other victims. So why do why do we ask that with victims that report a sexual assault or that report an abusive situation? If anything, what I know about victims is we undertell what has happened to us. We don't tell you the full story because it's horrific. We don't want to scare people away. It's embarrassing. It can be embarrassing. I'm not embarrassed anymore just because I want other victims. I know that there's other victims in the room when I'm talking. And I want them to see me not be ashamed because it's not my fault. I am difficult. I am not an easy person to live with. I am grumpy in the mornings. That did not give my ex-husband the right to beat me. I can be... I have hormonal fluctuations. That is true. Mm -hmm. That does not give somebody the right to harm me. I have no reason to be embarrassed. We always ask victims, why didn't they leave sooner? Why aren't we asking abusers why they don't leave? Why do they feel like they have to stay and do that to us? Why can't they leave? Why can't the boy or the girl that sexually assaults somebody wait till that person is sober? Why can't they wait? So why don't we ask those questions? For the false reporting, of course it happens. That happens in everything to some degree, but it's a very small degree. We get confused when we hear that unfounded. People say that was an unfounded case. That doesn't mean that didn't happen. The amount of evidence that it takes to prosecute a sexual assault case and the hell that victims go through, sometimes the prosecutor looks at that and goes, I don't want to do this to you. Because here's the other thing. Think about the cases where they do get convicted of rape and they get a week in prison. They get probation. It's a joke. It is. So if we're not going to, what is it going to do to that victim if... We say, yeah, he's guilty. You get to spend a couple of days in jail. What? You know, I I always tell people, look at the sex offender registry. See how many of these people walk among us and see what their offenses are. And I'm not talking. People have this idea like, oh, she was 16, he was 18. Uh Uh-uh. I'm talking three and four-year-olds. They don't stay in prison. People argue that all the time. We put violent offenders in prison. No, we don't. Rarely. Sometimes we do, but it's rare. They're more likely walking around the us. These are the things that we hope to change. But people need to understand because we have this idea it's like law and order in our mind. Right. Oh, we catch the bad guy and they go to prison. Not even close. What is your advice to someone who's just been raped? I know it's hard. If you can, 
go and get the rape kit done. You don't have to turn that in, but at least get your evidence there in health. Springfield, our uh, SANE nurses have done an amazing job getting the rules changed on that. They will hold those kits for a hundred years now. The statutes are, there are, there are some statutes that there are no uh, statutes of limitations mm-hmm. on it. Not all sexual assaults, but some. You can go get your rape kit done. Get it tested if you want to. You can now report anonymously if you want to. So that was one of the new things that has come about. And I can email you um, the information on that if you want. Yeah. Um, so now you can report anonymously or it can be unreported and the hospital will hold it there until you're ready to come forward. It's hard. There's no denying. You have to look at what people are going to say. People will defend rapists. And I'm not saying everybody should immediately throw somebody under the bus, but I would say... Rapists might get mad and come back after you. Yeah, and that can happen too. They will push that narrative. Well, she said it was okay. You saw her. She was hanging all over me. Mm-hmm. That kind of stuff, it can really backlash onto the victim. But my advice to people that have somebody that come forward and say so-and-so raped me, just listen. Don't You don't have to voice opinion. You don't have to say anything. Offer support. Hey, you know what? The Victim Center here in Springfield, they've got some people that you can talk to if you want to talk to them. Hey, I'm really sorry this has happened to you. Gosh. You don't have to say, oh, they would never do that because you don't know. Mm-hmm. You don't know. Yeah. Maybe they did. If they didn't, then that would be a horrible thing to have to go through. I'm not saying that we should, like I said, I'm not saying we should burn them all. We shouldn't convict them before we've heard anything, but... There's a time and a place. Talk to people, understand what the resources are and support victims when they come forward because they're probably, it's like nine times out of 10, they're telling you the truth. Probably not in nine and three quarters of the time they're telling the truth. I've got to take a moment to let you know that I'm trying to ask for some donations to help with covering the cost of production of Rape the Podcast. Please visit rapethepodcast.com to learn how you can support my efforts to talk about rape and hold my community accountable for how we treat rape victims. And I'd like to thank my husband, my daughters, my family, and everyone who has contributed both their stories and their ideas for inspiring this podcast. I've added an acknowledgements page in addition to resources and tips for self-care on the website. And if I mention something that you want more information about and you don't see it anywhere, I encourage you to email me and let me know springfieldapc at gmail.com. Please take care of yourself. If something that you hear in the podcast triggers memories or some feelings that you're not sure how to deal with, please call 1-800-656-HOPE and talk with a trained advocate. Visit RAIN.org for more information. That's RAIN with two N's. Something feels off though. I don't know if it's because I'm not like a regular reporter working for a media outlet. Maybe they think I don't know what I'm doing and really I am just figuring it out as I go along. But I'm having a hard time getting some of the main players in the story to talk to me. It's been over a year now that I've been going back and forth with a public information officer with the Springfield Police Department trying to nail down an interview with Chief Paul Williams. I am so proud of the advocates in the Springfield area. And while they have responded to me, they just haven't committed to interviews. And it's been over a year since I approached them all. Why is that? Is there something they don't want to say I feel like there's some toes they're not wanting to step on everybody's being very careful with what they say I didn't expect this story to have a fairy tale ending I anticipate bumps and bruises on the way in the next episode Janice is going to tell us her thoughts about what came out of the Springfield Sexual Assault Task Force And I'll talk with Lisa Farmer from the Harmony House, which is an incredible resource for domestic violence victims and their families. We're incredibly lucky in Springfield, I think, to have partners, law enforcement partners, criminal justice system partners, nonprofits that work together. I think everybody sees that we're all in this together and it's going to take all of us to make it you know, make Springfield really be a leading edge community for helping and supporting victims of crime.
Thanks for listening. I'm Julie Ballou, and this is Rape the Podcast. <laughs>